There is a kind of uh, underlying violence, I think, particularly yes. in blood flowers. Yes. Uh, I yeah, I think yeah, it ended with a, a girl, uh, you know, being violated, you know, raped and uh, killed. But a lot of these things are not reported, you know. So in my poetry, you know, you, you come up with these things and, uh, yet, and, and also the strangeness in it and how it is presented, I get it. But at the same time, I also like to highlight and bring in these small things that actually are very important because a lot of people disappear got killed and you know and and there's no answer for that so so th so this video uh, i want to capture that um you know uh, uh also want to put these uh, uh lyrics in 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 this the visuality of you know the, the area the fields and you know, uh, so i i want to create something atmospheric and also a bit surreal yeah, i think that was uh, that's what i found evocative about blood flowers was that it seems there is this kind of lyricism, but at the same time, there's this violence that is kind of creeps up on you. It's almost, uh, it's quite uncanny. Um, but the other, the other video, the Monument of Doubt. Could you uh, speak a bit about that? That I, was done I, in, in yeah, Vietnam. I, uh, yeah, yeah, I did the same. Uh, I did the uh, the other one in the same year, in 2018. I was invited to uh, for a short residency in in Ho Chi Minh City uh, by a. a an, an art institution called A Farm. It's and uh, San Art, which is a bit well known, which is well known. And um, so I went there, and I was so suffocated because everywhere I want, there's monuments, the statues, anger hole everywhere, you know. And I, I don't know how it's like for those people. Uh, for me, it's just I didn't want to be there. I ought to be honest because it feel like it's in the in my face all the time, you know, like. You know, shoving it down my throat, you know. So I feel these uh, political symbolisms, you know, it's also in my country as well, but not that much. But I feel, I mean, you know, we often, I mean, we hear the uh, party and, you know, the, 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 the people behind the symbolism, these political narratives, you know, uh, they, they keep the insisting this because um, they think it's a solution for, or, you know, how we should live. But, but we are seeing it's more of a poem than solution over time. You know, uh, actually, uh, we are stuck with its own narratives, you know, uh, in political, social. But at the same time, it's kind of very closed up system, you know, and making people more passive and sleepy in terms of how they engage in, you know, social and political, you know, uh, conversations. So I want to do something about it as well. And I collaborated with a Vietnamese artist, a young artist, because I collaborated with him because he had this incident just uh, with me when we were hanging out. We wandered out uh, somewhere for a drink and uh, we came across a dump and there is a, an, an, a broken statue of Anger Ho. He picked it up and uh, he wanted to do something with it. He brought it back home uh, to, to, uh, to where we lived, to where we were staying. And somebody followed him actually. So somebody tipped the, you know, the, the informer and the informer was, uh, you know, the police were following him. So, so I thought maybe we just maybe trying to push a little bit, you know? And so I asked him, would you do that? <laughs> so he performed it, but I just mentioned, I didn't mention his name, so it just said BNME artist, so you know, to protect him as well. Um, so it's um, a lot about this, yeah, passive, passivity, you know, that the symbolisms this created and, you know, these political narratives, because um, since I was a kid, you know, I have experienced uh, changes of governments and also, you know, a lot of governments in Southeast Asia, you know, we are seeing these, these, you know, uh, common trends where, you know, we have dictator-like, you know, uh, uh, governments, but uh, at the same time, not that, you know, I mean, it's just um, a bit tricky, but at the same time, um, I feel that we have to take apart these narratives. So taking apart narratives, that was my next question. So how does art in particular, uh, we'll come to poetry later, but how does art, creating art, allow you to deconstruct the various realities that you encounter? Yeah, I, I, one, one side of it is that I want to react to, to these things because I suffered, you know. I, I, that's, that's, that's where it came from first. But then I had to, I, I think about how I would work with it, you know, present it. But as usually it's helpful when I put a distance between the work and myself. So that I don't get burnt out, I don't get stressed out, you know, I don't get depressed. But it's also very helpful in a way that you see it from a, a little bit afar, and you know, you, you, so you, you have maybe if you use some tools, you know, and then 
you can play with these narratives, you know, you can uh, reconstruct it and, and present it back to the people, you know, look at it, you know, it's not like that. So you can, I mean, it's a lot of, you can walk around it a lot, but um, I think it's really important to deconstruct these old narratives. Uh, uh, from my experience in every aspect of my society, you know, from school, workplace, everywhere, um, they are dominant narratives, you know, uh, uh, created by people who are in power, you know, and um, they, yeah, they, a lot of people are buying into that as well, right? I mean, so that's even more important because we have to create this conversation, you know, at least maybe not, not intend to be insulting, but, you know, to uh, provoke, probably. Um, so in 2008, you co-founded the Beyond Pressure International Performance Art Festival. Could you tell me why you thought at that time, why did you feel performance art was a necessary mode of expression for you? Uh, after 1998 went, you know, um, uh, there, was, there were uprisings, right? And then uh, the, uh, we had a coup like we have right now. So I grew up at the time, so in 2000, in 1988, I was like uh, seven, eight years old. So you know, uh, I, I, I mean, happen to also experience how people make art. You know, and I, I have to say, I'm not. I have been very discontent with you know how uh, art's being made in Myanmar by uh, majority Burmese artists. You know, they just promote. Uh, nationalist, uh, you know, uh, narratives, you know, of you know, time to time again, and which is very much in line with what the government wants, right? So um, performance arts is very threatening to them, but at the same time, you cannot really uh, take action against that, because you know, in 1990s, like artists like Tang Lin, you know, Choi Tang, these senior artists, they started performing in a guerrilla style, you know, they just go into the market, do something quick, and then go back. So it's, uh, it's difficult for police to track down. So in, at a time, you are, you know, under pressure, or, and, you know, under oppression, I think performance arts can be very powerful and very, uh, you know, um, engaging with people. And people start to feel it's very strange because uh, and a guy is walking around in town, you know, wearing, um, uh, a, a bird's cage on the head, you know, a cage made by barbed wires. I'm referring to uh, 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 I'm referring to an, an artist's work. Um, uh, so you know, but later on, people also get it, you know, B because people knew that. Uh, I mean, we have censorship. We have, you know, some people knew that uh, we have to walk around a lot of stuff. But you know, and we have to come up with tools and ways to to deal with that. So um, Musa and I, we Musa was perf into performance so much uh, more than me, and um, uh, we thought about maybe performance speak here, but uh, we, we can try, you know, organizing because we also know that one side of the problem is uh, as we as we make more art or you know engaged in you know um, the art making processes, uh, we realize that we also need education. You know, we also need. Uh, uh, exchanges, you know, uh, learning from other people because we were so closed up, isolated for many years, uh, a lot of uh, cut off from, you know, the, um, the international art community. Uh, so we thought about maybe bring more, you know, uh, bring uh, foreign artists, you know, and then, you know, maybe, but uh, it was really difficult because we had censorship which wouldn't allow it to happen. So in 2008, we did it uh, secretly, you know, sub in separate places. Uh, it was done successfully, I, I would say. But in, in 2010, we took another step. We invited the censors. Yeah, we invited the censor, you know. So they said, what is performance art? They don't know. We cannot really explain. How will we explain? You know, I don't, we don't know. So we kind of, you know, give, um, I mean, we were just tricking them as well into, you know, believing that we are not doing something dangerous. So that they said, maybe your artists come to us and say what you want to do. Because it's not written stuff, you know, so, they, so the idea is only in the artist's head, which is very dangerous to them, you know. So they, the, the full censors, you know, would be sit, sitting in, in chairs and the artists lined up to pitch their idea to them. So uh, did, did they censor they, anything? They censor them. For instance, uh, you know, the, uh, an artist would like to use balloons and parts them. Uh, they would ask, why balloons? 
and what colors the balloons are. If don't, don't use red colors, for instance, like so they are just coming up with these silly things. Actually, really, you know. So they have, a, I think, like a manual or something, you know, where you have to ban uh, the image of star or, or 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 red or you know the, the certain things that you have to or, or mother even because you know even though we came from mother a mother you know they are thinking about our sensuji so you know. So better we also trick. Uh, we were successful with this at the time as well because they, because you know they could not do anything about it because they have already, you know, censored it, censor us. So they had to let us do it, right? That's but we did what we wanted to do. You kind of uh, use their own tricks on. Yeah, we did what we wanted to do because you know they weren't there at the festival, so we just did it. How long did that festival run for? Um, is usually like um, two weeks, mm. uh, depending. How many years? Um, it stopped in 2014. Mm -hmm. yeah. We did not have more funding, and uh, we were uh, we became a part as well. You know, I I went to Thailand, and you know, yeah. be, yes. So you work um, you work in many different genres, and some are interrelated. You work in visual and performance art, also in poetry, and also in literary translation. Um, but I would like to ask you how, even though these how do those mediums differ? Um, and how, of course, they encapsulate and they embody and they express things in different ways. But how do you feel or how do you sense that when you want to express something, that you would either go for the medium of visual art or performance art or poetry? Do, is it just instinctive? How do you do that? Um, f first of all, I, for me, you know, to to make art, it's to, ex to, to tell my stories, to, say, to tell the side of my stories. You know, I, I feel that I was born into a, a smaller section of the society which are, you know, destined to be, you know, destined to be uh, oppressed and, you know, not given chance, you know. So I got my national ID when I, when I turned 22, you know. So I became a uh, legal citizen only when I was 22. All my parents, my grandparents, my great grandparents, they all have, they all were legal citizens. But if you look like an Indian, you know, they still want to, you know, uh, you know, remove the rights that you are entitled to. So for me, a lot of things I have, you know, I I, I have a lot of these things to tell, and and also in, within the family, within the community. So for me, you know, I mean, the other people have told their stories, which, you know, it's totally not true. So right, um, so I thought I. I have to come up with something to tell my story. So uh, I first picked up poetry, and poetry is very good in a way that it already, you know, helpful to deconstruct these things because poetry, um, it's not the language we use in everyday life. It's it's skew, skew language, right? It's it's distorted. It's it's um, it's it touches us in different way than you know the the, the rational. A spoken language, right? So it's very powerful in a way, and also our country—it's a country of poets. In a way, I mean, we had we had president, right? As uh, we had a poet and president, and uh, in in many areas of the society as well. So, yeah, but um, in terms of other genres, I I'm very interested in you know exploring. I mean, I, I, I drew and painted when I was a kid as well. So I. I, I was very interested, but uh, I had to take time to relearn to do it as well. I mean, it's not very easy. Um, I devoted a lot of years to poetry, but um, uh, like a decade or more so, I started to also, you know, um, work in other fields as well. So um, to go into poetry now for a while, the, as you said, Myanmar has a strong poetic tradition. Um, could you give us? It's too, of course, we don't have time to go into a, a full history of Myanmar poetry, but could you give us a very, very brief history of, not history, but just a kind of a glimpse of so, what uh, it's like? So poetry was there in the last dynasties, even, you know, like in Burmese dynasty. So poetry, it's, it used to be um, stuff of the wise. You know, that's how, when you translate the, the word poetry in Kapya, you know, we say Kapya. So, um, so you just want a selective, selective people like uh, in the court, you know, would just write poetry for for the king and you know the the royal family. Uh, but but later on, um, after colonial uh, time, not during the colonial time, uh, lay people start to write poetry, you know, and lay people who are not connected with the 
with the you know um, a court, you know the palace. So that I think that's the beginning of it. But in there are many forms of poetry. You know, in the beginning, uh, depending on uh, the inventional schemes, you know, rhyme schemes. You know how you so usually the formats you have and you know and they they are very old and they were repeated a lot and you know but in night uh, but then we had this independence fight in 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 1940s then uh, we had these uh, educated poets at the university and so they they were more you now uh, they was exploring you know uh, poetry and and had a taste of modernism, I think, and then to, it evolved into you know uh, what we have today. So poetry also had a very um, uh, one side of it is the resistance, you know, and and, and anti-colonialism and anti-dictatorship. But another side we are seeing more and more is also experimental side of it. You know, uh, we have uh, become. Uh, um, a, a bit more open uh, to you know receiving you know inspiration and different forms of you know uh, writing poetry you know and so so yeah that's more or less I think. So you have you have spoken elsewhere about the importance of playfulness and experimentation in your own poetry. Could you say something about that? Why is playfulness so vital for you? I, I learned it from uh, poets like Charles Simich, you know, who passed away uh, later, uh, early this year. Uh, you know, he, I mean, he experienced World War II. I mean, devastating experience. I mean, many people have devastating experiences in, in our world. But how, I mean, when we, when we write poetry, how do we, do, do, we, do we deal with that, right? I mean, like Charles Simich, I mean, he would just, uh, pay attention to small things, you know, objects and their everyday life. But because these these things uh, uh, contain stories, you know, and so I, I learned from it. Because at the same time, you can bring in the strange, the bizarre into it, you know, uh, making it uh, uh, more urgent, you know. Also, uh, like poetry, like I said, um, it's not just about touching the rationality of our, you know, uh, us, but it's, we have other things and that uh, it, it can touch our, you know, uh, things that are uh, stored up in the unconscious, you know, and so on. So I, yeah. I love Charles Simic. I think he's, Charles yeah. Simic has an incredible sense I also, of humor. Yeah, yeah, I also, yeah humor. humor, yeah. That's, I also learned from um, Latin American writers, you know, they, they, but prose writers mainly, they, how they deal with the social issues in their work. So beautiful, right? I mean, like Igor, right? I mean, in similar veins, been writing uh, uh, um, uh, fiction. So I, I learned from these people, you know, how I deal with traumatic experiences, you know, and, and how, to, how to make it. I mean, I'm writing poetry, so, you know, I, I, I can share. It's not necessarily me putting the burden on people, right? It's, there has to be another experience when, for the reader. Could you say something about your engagement um also with some of the American poets. I think you've mentioned the influence of beat poets and language poets on some of your own work. Could you say something about that? Yeah, I think they, they help us break the mold of the, the old you know, poetry forms. But I kind of become a bit distant from, again, you know, I mean, it's just a learning process at the same time, like language poetry, when it came, uh, came around in 1980s. But in Myanmar, you know, it came in like, early 2000s, so late, so, but we learned from it how to work with the language, you know, a, it, a lot of problems in language that we use today, um, in, in Burmese language, you know, um, automatically, um, the female gender has been automatically undermined, right, the way we, I mean, we, we use, uh, uh, you know, we refer to, you know, women in the way we speak, so the language, it's already perceived as um, the given or, you know, but it has to be reinvented again, I think. So the language poetry and, you know, um, the avant-garde poetry help us to explore the language, to, to deconstruct it and to use it as tool, you know, to, to yeah. But it can be a bit boring at the same time. For me, I like, you know, um, maybe I, I'm now more leaning towards, yeah, a, a bit more direct, you know, with stock imagery, you know, just say things what you want to say, yeah. Um, as a poet, also, um, you mentioned just now that there there is a tradition of poetry as resistance as well um, in Myanmar. Do you also feel? How do you grapple with the political in your own poetry? And do you feel sometimes because of all the various 
difficult political situations until today in Myanmar. Do you feel a kind of pressure to express those concerns through your poetry? To, to deal with political you know, topics in poetry, you always take risks, right, in a country like Myanmar because you can get it thrown into jail. Uh, so there can be a lot of consequences, but you take risks. But, but at the same time, uh, we, we, you know, many poets, can, you know, they come up with a lot of metaphors, right? And, you know, they come up with a lot of things that people cannot just read into and say this is politics, right? But uh, at the same time, it's, yeah, but the, the other part of the, your question, what was it? So do you feel that, um, as a poet, do you feel this kind of pressure that you have oh, yeah, to comment yeah. I, on? I've been, you know, recently feel that maybe me and my fellow poets are so much defined by politics. So, uh, and that's not very good, you know, and um, because of where we are, you know, whatever we do has to be about politics. It's, you know, I mean, it has become, you know, over time very uh, monotonous, you know, and, uh, but uh, that's what we have to do again, you know, reinvent it, you know, reinvent our own poetry. But yeah, that's always pressure. Because, you know, when people are fighting, giving their life, writing poetry doesn't seem enough, does it? So, you know, that's there always this feeling that, oh, I'm not doing enough, you know, then, but yeah, but, you know, that's all we can do right now. But of course, if you look at poetry through the ages, like I, we were just talking about Porcelain, and he wrote about the devastating experience of the Holocaust. But in the end, when you read Porcelain, or, or when you read poets who come out of a, a terrible situation, they, they speak, and their language and their voice um, resonates through the ages, I think. And in the end, even though you might feel helpless yeah. at this moment in time, I think it does resonate, and it yeah. does have an aftermath. Yeah, yeah I, I have um, talked to some readers, and I, I'm very grateful that they, what, uh, of what they said. They said, um, I mean, you take it to somewhere, right, poetry? I mean, you, every reader has their own life experiences and their own back stories, you know, and it always come in, you know, uh, when they read the poetry, right, but that you take it where you want to be, but it has to be m more in open way, and you know, but there are also kind of end underlying, you know, things that, like you said, you know, which we can really relate, you know, so, so I think that's, yeah, that's good, yeah. Um, so, what is the publishing scene like in Myanmar at the moment, um, and also, Second question after that, also what does the art scene like in the Myanmar moment? Now we don't know if we should publish or not, right? I mean, if we publish a book, should we, will we be in trouble? We don't know. So their publishing houses have been quiet uh, since the coup. And we don't see any new poetry written anymore. There are some new poems, but uh, usually uh, resistance, you know, at, um, uh, propaganda you know, against dictatorship and so on. But yeah, it's been quiet. It's not very easy. Um, and also, I don't think people like to make art or write poetry anymore, you know? And, and that's what worries me, because you, you still have to do, find some way to do it. Otherwise, I'm, I'm worried because I, even now, I think a lot of uh, poets, writer, artists in Myanmar are struggling with uh, depression, I think. Because before the coup, there was a burgeoning art scene as well as a liter literary scene in Myanmar, am I not right? Yes, yes. Uh, and same with art scene, you know, um, we had these galleries popping up over the past 10 years and now it's gone uh, in an instant. So, you know, when you build something, it takes years, you know, and even it takes decades, but uh, to get rid, get rid of it, you know, you can do it instantly and that's very sad. Um, recently, uh, Coco Tet was involved in, a, in translating and editing an anthology of Myanmar poetry, which was published by Ethos Books in Singapore. Um, and it was kind of highlighting some of the voices from, from that, um, the coup and the violence and the impact that it had. But perhaps, is translation then perhaps a way of still um, making sure that some of these voices still exist? And maybe now is the time that literary translation um, is an important aspect of your work at the moment as well? I being, yeah, translating from time to time. I mean, um, we have opportunities to publish our poems in, in international journals and magazine from time to time. So poets um, would come to me, you know, request to translate their stuff and I do it. But I, 
I don't really focus on you know translating Burmese poetry to English. Uh, I think you need a good reason to do that sometimes, and and I yeah I, I sometimes I just don't know how, uh, but I've been doing a lot at the same time, so it's it's a bit crazy at the same. But for myself, uh, translated literature is very important. Um, I, not just for me, I think for a lot of people in my country, you know, uh, because our university is a shit, you know, and um, I mean, to even get to know, you know, um, a new writers, poets, you know, uh, we, we, there's no way you will go to university and you will know them. Uh, so, so you would just end up uh, reading, uh, you know, El, you know, Silas Manor, you know, by, you know so um, classic stuff, you know. So you translated a lot of work into Burmese. Right? I have, I have. Poetry as well as children's literature. Yes, yes. So could you speak a bit about that? Who were some of the poets that you translated and, and why? And also where were they published? Was it in literary journals? Were they in anthologies, book collections? What was it like? I, for me, uh, my process of writing poetry includes translation. Uh, because, you know, at one point I stopped writing poetry. For, I mean, I don't have any more to do. I, mean, I don't have anything to put in on paper, but I like to extend writing poetry in a different way, which is translation to me. Uh, so, you know, um, I only translate uh, poets that I really like, you know, or, or you know, in, uh, who inspires my own poetry. Um, I, I don't believe in intro introducing for the sake of introduction, you know, I don't believe in that uh, because you have to be very close to, like you said, Paul Salan, you translated it because you are, it's part of your soul. So for me, the same thing, um, uh, it has to be. And so I have translated poets like Adonis from Syria, you know, Maram al -Masri. I. I I also like to look at it in a way that, you know, I want to balance this out uh, in terms of language because English poetry always finds a way, you know, to, to, to you, uh, but uh, poetry written in other languages, you know, uh, is very difficult. So I also pay a lot of attention, you know, I mean, I, I explore a lot of international poetry. And I have also translated American poets like Ressa Edson, Charles Image, and I can remember, I have translated quite a lot, actually. Uh, some of them are collected in anthologies, some are, you know, standalone books. But um, perhaps you, you traverse language quite a lot, even in your own work. So you have written, or, or kind of rewritten, it's part translation, part rewriting, um, a chapbook in English as well, which you have here, I see, yes. uh, Mang De Gasoline. So could you tell us a bit about this book? This is, yeah, um, but I, it was published in 2012. Um, I worked on that for three or four years. It's really difficult for me because um, to write in English. I have shown it to, you know, like um, poets, American poets, some friends. Um, yeah, it's, it's really, diff I mean, it's not easy to really use language, you know, uh, in poetry, but then I thought about it. But even in your own, your own language, it's really difficult to write. So it's always difficult to write poetry anyway. Uh, and so I, I mean, for me, I, don't translate my poems into English. I versionier it, you know, I, I make different versions of it because what my work in Burmese po version doesn't really work or translate into English. So, you know, I make a lot of changes. And I always take liberties, you know, to, 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 to be free in, a way, in the way I write and translate. So, yeah, you're right. Uh, I, I, it, they are not exact, you know, line to line, uh, trans, line from line translation. Uh, they are versions. Um, are you planning to write more in English as well? I, I, I have a book coming out uh, in September. Um, it's called Death in Summer. It's a collection of prose poems. I, I have written a collection of prose poems called Making a Fire um, uh, three, four years ago. I created new version, uh, sorry, versions of these poems in English. So there is that, and yeah, I, I, I don't know, I'm now more focused on making art, m maybe. Um, and um, just to go back briefly to your poetry, because um, after this we will, you're going to yeah. read some of your poetry for us. Um, but, so when you started to write your poetry then, how did you, where were you first published? Was it in a, a newspaper, was it in journal, how did it? How I did it started writing poetry in many pseudonyms. 
uh, <laughs> I wasn't confident. I was, uh, you know, experimenting at the same time. So but I, they were, uh, some of them were picked up by magazines. Mm -hmm. So my first uh, poem was published in a magazine, yes. Uh, but then um, later on, I adopted uh, Mount Day as the, the permanent pseudonym. And then, yeah. And who was the publishing house that publishes you? Uh, the Eros. And there are a few publishing houses that I've been working with um, over the years. And they're also, at the moment, just not active? Not active. How are they surviving? Are they? Yeah, I don't, I, I mean, yeah, everybody, I mean, now struggling, you know, ec economically, you know, uh, financial, I mean, yeah, it's a difficult time. So, before we, before you read for us some of your poetry, I just want to ask um, a question about how do these kinds of international or regional openings of solidarity, where we can, where we can listen to you talk and we can, you can share um, your experience with us, how does that help or does it help the you and our friends in Myanmar? Yeah, um, we felt left out for many years, you know, also we didn't know how to communicate and you know how to, so we are very isolated and, um, but we, we knew that we wanted to talk to other poets, you know, from, from other countries who want to do, ex do exchanges. Um, but when, once we got this chance, we, we just jumped on it. And, you know, uh, we were also lucky because like, like um, international writing programs from Iowa universities, they're supporting, you know, like inviting a, a poet or writer every year, you know, since uh, the 90s. Um, so we appreciate it. We knew that, you know, when you come back from somewhere, you bring something, right? I mean, we knew, because we, we are so hungry uh, for new, we, are, we, are, we were so hungry. Uh, from my own experience, I, uh, whatever I am benefiting today, you know, in, in, in my work, um, it's from, it comes from uh, friends and, you know, art communities that I have, that I, that I have um, um, had opportunity to, to meet and, you know, make friends with. Um, th thank you so much, Mangde. I'm just going to step aside for a little while because I think Mangde is going to read some poetry for us, um, a couple of poems in Burmese and also yeah. in English. And then I will come back later and open for questions. Okay. Thank you. I will be uh, reading a poem in Burmese, so you get the sense of uh, the language. And I will be reading uh, several others in English. Miao kapya, ngai miao go sabwe ma chu ne to sa chui bi di kapya o ye kai ge la pi. Da ha ngai nao so miao kapya, da ha tiu pi ye nao so chu ru lu tu lu tu mu pi. Chai wan ni ga xiang wu ga ngai chi. တော်ကိုယောတစ်ပင်ကိုယောနောက်မမြင်ရအသားစာဝီလာငါးတွေကရှံကုန်မြို့ကိုတမုတ်တရာရဲ့အမောင်ဆုံးနေရစီခေါ
Brana ma jabi, shango wunga chi. Shango nga miyain taani de, click sandra kao lu, ngao piyan chi. Maho hu, shango ha, lanja de ma, ko shu ni de kli diya wye miya lo ni de, ngao piyan chi. Di ke biya ha, ngao ye nao so, miyao ke biya. Di ke biya ha, miyao du ye nao so, aga ta ki piya de. I'm going to read the English version of the poem. It is called Mankey Poem. Um, I made some changes uh, in the English version. Mankey Poem. I chained my Mankey to the table, fed him, and made him write this poem. This is going to be my last Mankey Poem. This is going to be the last rocket launched by the Chinese. I gaze upon Django down in the valley. I can't see the tree, nor the forest, but I can see its rod and beams and pillars. I can see the killer whales taking it away to where the ocean is darkest. The valley is damned beautiful, but the bodies they found in it have made everyone nervous. She will go into the twilight and find a body. She will slip under the covers, and there will be another dying next to you. I stand on the balcony and look at Django. Django looks back at me like an animal in heat. No, it looks back at me with the eyes of a child sniffing his first glue in an alley. This is going to be my last monkey poem. This is going to be the last space travel of monkeys. This is called Mysterious Octopus. Mysterious octopus. Today, the government talks about a mysterious octopus which attacked civilians boning their hookers in the bushes by a lake. Box-colored brenners nest inside a stupor. They ordain deathless fix. I am fed up with spastic divas. There was another in my beans this morning. I spent my day but deleting vowels from my doctor's prescription. A group of journalists line up to lick the gold off the city hall. In a bar, a group of young tourists eat rhino balls from shark glasses. The end of a year is not a string of pearls at all. I download Depeche Mode and I download The Cure. I download the Rohingyas and the Battle of Master Moor. Free crops glow in the dark. I talk on the periphery of sleep. And I'd like to read a, a, a several poems from uh, my, my upcoming book. Uh, these poems are pretty much autobiographical, I think. Um, um, these poems kind of trace back um, the origins of my grandparents. As, as, as well as uh, it's so much about my family and, and, and the city I live in. The first poem is called Migrants. When my grandparents moved to the city, they walked a dirt road that stretched for over a thousand miles. The road smelled of gunpowder and smoke. When it was time for lunch, they sat down and stared at each other until wild flowers sprang up from their eyes. They ate the flowers and continued their journey. Bandits and militias awaited them on their way. My grandparents had to leave their belongings one piece at a time. By the time they got to the city, there was no clothes left on their bodies. Fire. My mother is afraid of fire. She has seen villages completely devoured as if they never existed before. She thinks fire has the face of a daydreamer. She often says fire is both soft as a cotton and brutal as a tyrant. Every morning, she offers yellow flowers at the shrine, praying the fire leaves her family alone. There was this one time when my father told her about a Vietnamese monk. 
the monk burned himself to death on the streets of Saigo, protesting against the persecution of Buddhist monks by the government. My mother listened to the story and cried, her tears glistening like salt in the sun. Angkor, after my family moved to the city, one of my uncles visited from a rural town to see us. Upon arriving at our house, he wanted the rain tree in our, in our yard instead of coming inside. When I looked at him, I could only see parts of him between the leaves. My mother needed to shout to have a conversation with him. At night, lying in bed, I hear him singing. His songs were about paddies, rivers, and his dead dog, whose ghost came back to see him. My uncle stayed in the tree for a week and went back home. Shango, 1988. The tall man in ragged clothes was ordering other men to slit the throat of the policeman. He shouted, this pig has been sucking our blood for a long time. Other men did as he said. I was an 80-year-old boy when this happened, but I saw the tall man in ragged clothes again after some years. This time, I saw him in a painting, in a museum. He was taking a picnic with his family in the shade of a large tree. A rainy day in the city. If you don't look closely, you won't see the city. It sits in a darkness from which it can rise again. In the drizzling rain, a homeless man stands on the dock, beaming like a beacon. Actually, it's no man but a meteor coming down to touch the surface of the river gently. In the drizzling rain, the full bridges of the city burst into flames. A corpse waiting for a burial at a monastery matters how much he hates the wet days. A corpse that soon will molt in the rain-soaked ground. This is uh, going to be the last poem called Things They Carry. With the knife falling, they came into the city. They sleep beside women, and they are not the husbands. Do surgeries on men, and they are not surgeons. Bury children in the riverbed, and they are not the parents. They dig up earth and demolish old buildings, and they are not grave diggers or construction workers. They have flower poor heads and are not attacked by stray dogs. We follow them and make a list of things they carry. They carry moons, powder skulls, cans of food, shrapnel wounds of rainbows, bankers, oil tankers. They never leave the city again. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mang Day. That was very powerful. I Thank particularly you. like that last poem. I think the, the imagery was incredibly powerful. Is that, is that from your upcoming book? Yeah, they will be um, in, the, in the book, yeah. Um, I actually want to ask you a question, because we were talking earlier over lunch about um, gender. So we did mention also, you did mention to me that you also felt, this is um, not about the military, but about the circles of poets themselves, and, and possibly oh, also yes, artists. Yes. What about the gender I, I think, uh, imbalance? Like I, uh, the, I mentioned the campaign against people, right? Like uh, campaigns against intellect. So I think uh, a lot of poets, even like writers in our you know, circle, um, um, they are not aware of a lot of things. You know? They are still doing the same things you know, and uh, thinking this is right, uh, one, which, uh, one of which is they have decided women doesn't write. Women don't write good poems in Myanmar. You know, so um, I have talked to, uh, especially senior poets. You know, they they don't write uh, women's poetry, and no no one wants to translate them into English. You know, and uh, so I solely I took take that responsibility and um, to do uh, to do it. So, uh, also, because you know, I've been working with women poets, and they write very very interesting poetry. You know, not just in Myanmar, everywhere. I mean, she just. I mean, a lot of right. So, uh, so I've been working with younger, uh, uh, um, you know, women poets. Yeah, it's terrible. Uh, sexism, you know, uh, among the writers and poets. Yeah, I don't know. It's also our. I mean, the society is traditionally very uh, 
what you call it? Um, patriarchy. Patriarchal? Patriarchal, yeah. So, you know. But Burmese women are also very strong. Actually, very every strong. family is led by women, you know. But, uh, they w I mean, men, when it comes to making decisions, uh, when it, yeah, I mean, you know, they, they stay hold a lot of power, men in society. Women are more into practical stuff, you know, and which is not quite good, I mean, which is terrible. And uh, still, in my country, men still don't count women's work as work, right? I mean, it's, um, they just spend so much time doing housework, and um, so so. I think that's a problem in many places. Yeah. But yes, yeah. yeah. So we don't want to see them in you know different aspects of life, or I don't know what is it. I mean, just. Is that similar in the art? Circles as well. Oh no no! In art, uh, women are very strong. Uh, like nearly, I mean, there are a lot of uh, women artists. I mean, again, in poetry, it could be subtle, not subtle, but it has, it, it depends on interpretation. But visually, you know, when you just paint a vagina, I mean, golden, I mean, I mean it's powerful. Uh, so a lot of young uh, women artists and uh, mid-age, middle-age uh, women artists have been doing uh, great things, I think. Also performance, uh, there are performance artists, uh, you know, who are women and, you know, yeah. But in poetry, it's not like that. Also, in 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 written literature like prose, it's not like that. Very feisty women artists in my country. You know, they're like, ah, you know, don't. I mean, because they being to places as well. You know, I mean, as a poet, it's dif more difficult to go to another place than an artist to me. I think because uh, poetry festivals festivals are not that many, and we are not invited that much. You know, but uh, our community is bigger. Uh, internet, I mean, you know, for us, I think uh, so. Women artists um, are able to go uh, to many countries, see many things. You know, so they are, you know, yeah, right in your face. <laughs> Any more questions? If there's no more questions, I think I will bring it to a close. You can always approach Mang Day and have a private conversation sure with then. him after. Please go and see his artworks at the back um, if you haven't already. And please join me to thank the presence um, of Mang Day today. Thank you. So thank you very much. <laughs>